Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie and indeed, you're very welcome along to this week's edition of Friday Night Racing, the first live edition of 2021. Happy New Year to everybody. Happy New Year to you, Johnny Ward. How are you getting on? Um, not too bad, Ger. Happy New Year to uh, all our viewers and listeners. Hopefully, um, hopefully we've uh, a good show. And um, racing, the show goes on, which is the main thing at the moment. Yeah, you brought big energy to that, Johnny. I hope you're going to bring the same energy to the rest <laughs> of the year, too. It's tough, Ger. It's like, you know, it's cold. Um it's January, you know, my dry January lasted as far as Saturday, which is the 2nd of January. So, you know, my motivation levels could be better at the moment. All right. Well, look, uh, hopefully everybody's going to get cheered up by spending an hour in our company this <laughs> afternoon. And a reminder, Friday Night Racing and Off the Ball brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie or follow on Twitter at HRI Racing. I'm delighted to say our guest this week is Jonathan Moore, a jockey fresh off his first grade one winner at Leverstown. Jonathan, I'd say you're a bit more excited than Johnny Ward at the moment. Yeah, no, it's a uh, exciting time of year, and it was um, great to get that first grade one winner under my belt. Yeah, well, look, we'll talk about that in a moment. But this must be the best time of year for a, a national hunt jockey, where the the big races are coming thick and fast, and you're far enough away from the end of year to be able to, if you're not having a great time, to ride yourself into some form, or if you are having a great time, to be thinking, ooh, actually, you know what, this this could be the best four or five months of my life. Yeah, no, it's um especially after Leprestown at Christmas, um everything's gearing towards the likes of Cheltenham and the spring festivals and you kind of the good horses are sorting themselves from the bad horses in all your yards and um you know it's exciting. Some of the horses have came to come to the fore in Leprestown and some of the horses didn't. So uh the ones that have come to the fore, you're starting to get excited about them and what they can do in the spring. And like on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment, if you're not actually going racing um, as a stable jockey for Gavin Cromwell, does that mean you're riding out with him every morning or is it a couple of mornings a week and riding out somewhere else? What, what's your day-to-day -day actually like? Yeah, um, I'm with Gavin four mornings a week um, and I go into Noel Meads one morning a week and then I leave one morning spare to go wherever the entries may be or wherever I think I can get up a spare ride, I might go pop into a... Uh, a different yard that that uh spare day then that's a that's a marketing day is it you go around and remind everybody hey look i'm here i'm i'm in good form what's going on that kind of stuff yeah it's, it's just um a trainer you look through maybe an entries that has a few entries during the week or um someone that you ride the spare the odd spare ride for you might pop into them there and that that spare morning to um keep your head keep your foot in the door really Yeah, it's interesting you went back. You mentioned Noel Mead as well, uh, Johnny, because he was massive in terms of your development. And I suppose in some respects, he might have kick-started your career. Yeah, no, um, Noel has been very good to me. Um, I went to Noel, I think I had 10 winners ridden when I went to him. And uh, I'm sure he gave me, my, my, I think my third ride from was Cork National and it won. And it was favourite as well to put a £7 claimer up for that. And uh yeah, no, he's given me a lot of big days, and he he's uh, yeah he probably propelled my career onto the next level when when I needed someone to do that. What's he like to ride for? Like you look at the, we've had Sean Flanagan on a couple of times, and you know the 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 career that he's had since he moved to Nolan. And obviously, you remember Barry Garrity rode from Paul Carby, synonymous with him. Niall Madden, who retired recently, synonymous with the yard as well. Dennis O'Regan, real class uh, act in terms of the jockeys that have come through there. Is he a good boss to have when when you were with him? Yeah, no, he's a uh, he's a great boss, and like I, I even go in there one day a week still, and uh, I enjoy going in there. He's He's a great man to give you confidence and uh, sure, obviously he, he improves your riding because um, I'm twice the rider when I went to him and I'd say a lot of that is down to the way he kind of um, brings brings you along. When you say twice the rider, like how how much, how much, how, why can you improve to that extent? Is it because just, is it the experience of riding horses or the experience of riding good horses? Because I guess like, uh, a promising jockey can become a bad jockey if he just doesn't get the run of the green in terms of the the yard he's in or whatever. Yeah, I suppose in Knowles, um, when I when I first went there, Paul Carberry was still riding out, and uh, 
couple like that. And you just learn so much from right now with those lads. And then the caliber of horse Noel had in training was was better than horses probably that I was used to riding. And uh, they all probably come together and, and just make you a better rider, you know. How did it start for you, your your county Wexford man, um, no more than Sean, who we mentioned there, and uh, you know, there's actually a lot of racing in Wexford, particularly kind of the point to point scene. But was it something that maybe you thought your size was uh, fitted towards doing, or was it something you got into early? Um, well, I grew up on a farm, dairy farm down in Wexford, and we we've horses on the farm, and um, we I started off hunting, and I think I first hunted the age of five, and I saw jumping and eventing mostly. Then um, as progressed through the scene, and um, I was probably 12 or 13 and I, I went and rode it, started riding out race horses for um, local trainer Mosey McCabe and as soon as you start riding out thoroughbreds at that age or um, the speed and everything, you, there's nothing more you want to do so that's probably when I realised I wanted to be a jockey and luckily then I, I stayed light and uh, that all helped. You mentioned, what you mentioned there, uh, that's kind of uh, something I've said before on the show. You said once you started riding horses at speed, there was nothing else you wanted to do. And do you, do you think that like if there were, if you, if you, if you took a hundred kids from any, all parts of the country and you, and you put them on horses like that, once they could ride, how many of them would be hooked by it? I'd say the majority of system, anyone that um, likes a bit of adrenaline rush or um, anything like that. Once you ride your first turbo ride up a gallop um, at speed, I can still remember. And I, yeah, as I say, I don't think it's twelve or thirteen. And yeah, there was there was nothing like it at the time. And uh, it kind of gets you hooked straight away. Like that's that's what you want to do. That's that's the adrenaline rush you want. How did you get there? Like you must have known that this was going to be very exciting. So was it was it uh, like how did how did that actually come about? What was the build up to that? Um to get to a jockey from that stage or well no to, to, before you get your first ride you must go I want to do that like so you've yeah. been doing point you've been doing show jumping and venting and then you must have seen the race and, and somebody must have allowed you your, your mum and dad must have said okay that's fine and they must have phoned somebody so there must have been great excitement about the whole process of getting that first opportunity yeah, well, uh, it was actually Mosey McCabe's son, um, Edmund McCabe, same age as me, and he's a good friend of mine, and I, I played hurling and football and soccer with him. And um, one one morning, he or one day, he's, his, fa- his father was there, and Mosey, and Mosey asked me, did I want to come up and ride out thoroughbreds? And uh, I said, yeah, that'd be cool. And I went down to his yard, and, yeah, I rode out that morning. I think I rode three lots that morning, and uh, I remember getting home and telling my mother and father, this is what I want to do. Um, the thrill I got off that this morning, and and I think my mother probably rolled her eyes up to heaven, and my father probably laughed. But um, yeah, that's that. I was hooked then. Yeah, because we were. And what was actually, it actually like? Yeah, sorry, Joe. Yeah, well, it was, what was it actually like? Yeah, sure. It was it was riding uh, like I was used to ponies that you're going around hunter trials and cross country courses, and you think you're going fast. When you get up on a thoroughbred, you know, a half a ton animal, and you're going up a gallop at the speed and the power they have you're 12 or 13 years of age um so you think there's nothing like it and uh yeah it was um a great thrill and uh, um that's how that's that's how we got hooked i suppose did your when you say your mother rolled her eyes up to heaven like um i was actually talking to this to talking about this to a couple of people on on the saturday show last week in terms of if if your kids want to get involved in a certain sport and we spoke about rugby and other sports was was it a concern for your parents considering the dangers involved um it was yeah but um my mother's a teacher herself and she she kind of always um pushed us into something like kind of always told us if you're interested in something or you're passionate about something she wouldn't get in her way so mm. she probably didn't think I, at that stage I was going to progress to be a jockey but um, she definitely didn't stand in my way and helped me out as much as she could her, herself and my father you know Obviously you've got horses on the farm and you know you're not unfamiliar with the care and the, the what it takes but it's not it's not racing it's it's different and it's a completely different industry so how do you go from a 12 year old with dreams to actually becoming a jockey then? Well, yeah, um, every school holiday and every Saturday, Sunday mornings, I was going riding out from then on. And then I, I, um, 
I probably wanted a, a way to get out of school to be a jockey. My mother being a teacher, that was going to be quite difficult. So um, when I was, <laughs> so a, after my junior start, I went to race at the racing academy in Kildare. I knew that would be a good stepping stone to becoming a jockey. Um, coming from our background, that didn't really have racing, and uh, race was supposed to be a transition year, and I was supposed to go back and do my leaving start. Um, which my mother still haven't forgiven me for not doing, but uh, um, I, I suppose when I was when I finished race, I I was light and I could be an apprentice. And I was sixteen, and yeah, I went and got my apprentice apprentice license um, with Gordon Elliott then, and Gordon gave me my first few rides, and yeah, and no looking back really. But uh, as I say, my mother still hasn't forgiven me for not doing my limbs or. And when did you start feeling comfortable? Like, so you, you've you've done the apprentice and you've got experience in great yards. When did you start feeling like, yeah, I, I actually just understand what my role is, what I'm supposed to do. I, I can be myself at the start line. I can be myself, you know, in the middle of a race when some of the best jockeys in the world are against me. When does when do you start to feel like, okay, I know what the lay of the land is here? Well. I actually um, got off to a ter- terrible start, really. I was 16, and I didn't ride my first winner till I was 20. I had four years, but through those four years, I worked really hard and really wanted to be to make it, to make it as a jockey, to ride winners. And I suppose I rode my first winner then when I was when I was 20. But I, because it took me so long to do it, I learned so much, and I appreciated um, it a lot more. And I kind of took off from me then. I, I wrote out my claim in two years then. So I suppose somewhere between 20 and 22, I realized I um, maybe um, I, I could make a good living at this. At the, the fact you mentioned, Johnny, there, that it did take so long, was that tough on you mentally? You know, there are very precocious young riders. You see Jack Kendy's coming from the pony racing sphere. His first ride's at 16, but straight away he's bang into it. There were, you know, a lot of jockeys are late developers. Were you always confident you'd get there? Um, I, I didn't really know being honest with you, Johnny. I like you know those first four years it was tough, like n- not riding a winner in in four years, and and you're you're starting at sixteen and people are telling you you're going to hit the ground running, and you're not running at all. Um, mm. so that was that was t- I tell you that 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 was tough now and it tested me a lot now uh, being a young man. Like it, I, there was days when you thought, Jesus what am I doing all this work for? Maybe maybe I should go do something else. But uh, I, I think the main thing was I just stayed really focused. And then when it did come, I I appreciated it a lot more and probably kept my head down a lot more because of it. I think it's so important as well, isn't it, to be a grounded individual um, like Ger and I were as, as teenagers, you know, that you know, you know that uh, you have to kind of keep your eye on the job here because, like, there is a temptation for young jockeys, particularly, you know, kids that can be around the current to kind of lose the run of themselves if things are going well or badly. Yeah, no, um, I suppose when, when, you, when you're 16 or when, when, when you start getting going well as a jockey and you're making a few pounds and everyone's calling you a superstar and you're going to make a lot of money and you're, you're wanting to buy cars and do all that stuff. I, I'm sure it's very easy to get sucked into that, uh, I don't know, football or lifestyle maybe or something as a young lad and mm-hmm. kind of waste everything. But I suppose my four years there not doing anything, I kind of matured to all that. And uh, once my chance came, I was I was ready for it and mentally and um Physically, yes, it was. Mm. How many races are you talking about here over that four-year period where you didn't have a winner? If you were to combine those four years, how many? How many times do you think you saddled up and actually didn't didn't get a winner? I think I had just shy of a hundred rides in that four years. So um, a lot of horses were saddled before having my first winner <laughs> over a long period of time. Right. And did you get close? Were there seconds? Were there short heads that you were being beaten in? Yeah, um, I was beaten ahead when I was 16 in a opportunity race in Down Royal. Um, I was riding a horse with Colin Murphy in an opportunity in Wexford one day. Looked like I was going to win and 10 lengths clear going to the last fell, broke my collarbone. So um, there was days it looked like it was going to happen. And then when it hadn't happened, you're wondering, was it ever going to happen? But luckily I stayed focused and uh, it worked out. 
And so when the first when the first win happens, like what what is the emotion of that? Relief. <laughs> that was that was my emotion because it, it was so long coming. Um, oh yeah, I won't forget that day anyway. At Tipperary, I think the twenty something of July two thousand and fourteen. It was a a big day for everyone in my house, I think, as well, because it probably I probably had family members and friends that were kind of saying, "Is this lad?" Isn't going to be a jockey at all. He'll never ride a winner. I was getting that the whole time. Yeah. This lad will never ride a winner. And yeah, when I got that, I suppose but the biggest, the, the biggest feeling was relief. Who was the name of the horse actually? Uh, Coolior Della Loy was his name for Michael Cleary. That's right, Collar Della Loy. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you remember much about the like a small yard as well? And I, I, I guess you. Yeah, it was a special day for you and it's like Michael Cleary to have a winner as well. They, they're the ones that they, you know, you would appreciate as well, the smaller stable. Yeah, no, um, it was great. The horse had never won before and I'd never won before. And yeah, it was, uh, I suppose he was maybe fancied to run well and maybe be placed, but uh, he actually bossed the race and won really well. And then you ride your claim out quickly, and at that point the confidence comes. But the the value of the four years experience, I, I presume, begins to show that you, you know you feel like your your own skills. Uh, what's what, what point does the uh, entry to know me kind of come into all this and begin to give you the confidence that like not only are you supposed to be here, but you're going to have a good career here? I suppose um, I was I was riding. A seven pound claimer. I think I had, yeah, had ten or eleven winners ridden, and I went to Noel Mead. It was actually Barry Garrity that got me the job at Noel Mead. And uh, I suppose when I went to Noel's, then I started riding a better caliber of horse um, in, be in all the better handicaps. You know, the likes of the Cork Nationals, as I said, and Leperstown at Christmas. And uh, I was actually lucky then that season, my first season with Noel Mead. I think I rode three or four Grade A handicap winners. I won a Leinster National. Uh, a Leprechaun Chase, a Punchdown Festival winner, Cork National and Midlands National. And yeah, that kind of all led then to, yeah, different things opening up and uh, kind of thought at that stage, yeah, then I might make a go at this, a good go at this. <laughs> I suppose as well, the confidence that that brings you, that also turns you into a better jockey. Is that, that, that seems to be the intangible here when we, we ask everybody like, you know, trying to make the point a little bit earlier on. I'm not sure how much of it you heard. Like you, you can ride the ride of your life on a horse that finishes fifth or sixth, but the horse should have finished tenth or twelfth. And we don't know anything about that. So, like your own form and your own sense of what's working and what's not working, part of that just comes from experience, I suspect. Yeah, it is. It's it's a lot of it is down to experience. But um, as you say there, um, it's all about the caliber of horse you have underneath you and you're riding good horses and you're riding winners, your confidence is high. And when your confidence is high, you know, in any sport, you start making the right decisions. And that just all leads to, I suppose, um, you building your career and, and, and building your profile as a jockey. Just uh, when when you are like doing well with Noel Mead, it's kind of, um, it's a bit like, we'll say, if you're if you're doing well for the Ireland under 21s or you're doing well for the minor team, it um, doesn't necessarily mean that the same boss is going to have you for the seniors, for example. Um, and was that how much of a, do you know, how much of a concern was that I, 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 I as good as a, I might be doing as a young jockey, it's not inevitable that I will progress, like, in terms of getting a proper senior job? Well, yeah, sure, that, that was it. That season, as I said, um, you know, you're you're going through your claim and you're wondering, yeah, well, this is great, but I need a job at the end of this, you know, because um, there's going to be claimers coming behind me. But um, I was lucky at the end of that season at Punchestown, I rode a winner for Rebecca Curtis, um, Irish Cavalier and the, the Grade A handicap at Punchestown. And um, because of that, um, she offered me a stable jockey job with her which was massive at the time for a lad that was still actually a five-pound claimer. Well, this is this is interesting, so, because to kind of borrow the football parlance again, now you're an Irish footballer who goes over to Britain like so many have, and now you're an Irish jockey who goes over to Britain, in this instance, Wales. Um, was that hard to move out of your country and to move out of your comfort zone, and how did it go? Well, I, I actually, 
I actually based myself in Ireland while I was stable jockey to her. I used to fly over and back, even though I was in England five, six days a week, I was actually flying over and back a good bit. Um, because, Re- because Rebecca was, was so far down in Wales, you, it would be just a waste of time going basing yourself down there. So I was I was flying over and back to race mainly race courses and all um and uh yeah it was uh you say like you go over there and a lot of lads come home with their tail between their legs, but um before I came home and bit tail between my legs I rode a lot of nice winners. It is um it is a bit of a you know, it's a daily grind over there as well that like if you're if you're riding, you're riding kind of a lot of ordinary races, a lot of um, ordinary horses, prize money mightn't be great and it like it's not necessarily the most glamorous thing in the world, particularly if you're going badly. No, that's what I, I noticed there a good bit. Like over there, it was um, oh, sure, it's it's a day in day out day of racing every day, and in the winter, it was racing every day. But the one thing I was lucky with Rebecca was she actually had a real good caliber of horse, and anything that went below a certain level, she just got rid of them. So she just had a lot of weekend horses and not a whole pile of weekday horses at that time, mm. and so I never had to actually experience that. Um, real grafting in England. I kind of lived a, a better lifestyle than I probably should have at the time. What do you mean by that? Well, sir, I wasn't, I wasn't even riding out. I was only flying over to where the race meeting was, stay over there for a couple of days, stay with friends, maybe go back down Thursday and ride out a day, then go racing. And yeah, I, um, I done a lot of air miles and a lot of traveling, but I didn't do a whole pile of grafting, working hard, riding out or going to the somethings of a Monday or anything like that. And uh, was, that a, was that a good thing? Was that like, a, was that a getting that out of your system period of your life in some ways? Well, at the time it was, I was going over a stable jockey and I thought it would last forever, but um, like most things in life, it didn't last forever. It lasted for a year and a half, but it was, it was a great year and a half. What went wrong? Me, Rebecca just, she went from having over summer. She went from having seventy horses to twenty horses, and I wasn't living over there, and I was neither here nor there. And Noel was after getting very busy back in Ireland, and kind of came to a stage where second jockey to Noel was better than stable jockey to Rebecca, um, mm. and that's why I decided I made a decision. I think it was November time. I'd be better off based back in Ireland. But that year and a half I had with Rebecca, like that was invaluable. I got to ride in all, a lot of big races and I learned so much, you know, riding in at big meetings, big races in England, Shetlands and entries and riding good horses over there. You know, it was it was a, it was a great stepping stone and I'm forever grateful for like the 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 rise and the winners I got from that 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 yard. I do like asking jockeys this: What are the differences in riding in a Bog standard Irish race and a bog standard British race in terms of jockey ship. Um, wouldn't be as competitive over there. You get a lot more room here, and uh, lads are probably or a lot, a lot more room over there. I mean, and lads are probably a, a lot nicer to you through your races over there. And um, Ireland is so competitive; you, you don't get an inch, and it's you know it's dog eat dog when you're out in that racetrack. Where in the UK, I suppose, 99 times out of 100, the best horse will win the race and he'll have a clean run through. And, um, yeah, it's it's definitely easier to ride in the, the UK. Um, but uh, great fun uh, riding in Ireland too. Yeah, like we've had a lot of Brit bash and Jura with Brexit and all that, but it does go to show the the British people in general, they're just nice, mannerly, friendly people, and we could actually learn a lot from them. <laughs> Don, well, yeah. here, though, that the, the Irish, it's, um, you know, because we, we, we talk all the time about the golden age of jockeys that we're now coming to an end of. The, the last couple of the that golden age of all-time great jockeys are just coming to retirement now over the next while and uh, yours is the generation that's going to have to replace them. So um, the culture that you've inherited sounds like it is, you know, you, you said Barry Garrity helped you to get the job at Noel Mead. So obviously he was looking out for the next generation and seems like a, a genuinely nice person. Um, but I would say on a racetrack, him and Ruby and, uh, and Davey Russell, like they've got their elbows out literally and metaphorically. Yeah, well, like, you know, um, 
football team or rugby team there, they have whatever, 11 men around them, 15 men around them to help them out. When you're out on that racetrack, it's me against you and that's just that. It doesn't matter if you're a seven-pound claimer starting off or you're Barry Garrity after riding a couple of thousand winners. Um, you're there fighting for your corner, for your trainer, for your owners and that's the way you have to be. You know, it's um, an inch... An inch wouldn't be given, and an inch shouldn't be given. You enjoy that? Well, yeah, that's that's all a part of it. You know, that's race riding, and that's and that's um, that's li life as a as a jockey. You know, um, the, it's every man for himself. And listen, when when we go back into the weigh room, we're all friends, and everything's great. Um, but when you're out on that racetrack, it's every man for himself, and that's how it is. <laughs> How did the Gavin Cromwell but, uh, thing come around? Sorry, Ger. Yeah, how did the... I mean, this was the move that kind of, I, I guess, changed your life. If, if you're talking about Rebecca Curtis going down numbers at that time, you know, any time I visit Gavin's, I, I'm amazed. It's like an explosion of people, an explosion of horses, an explosion of facilities, and you're the top dog there now. Yeah, no, um, I was... It's like anything. I was back in Ireland a year now at this stage after Rebecca's, and I was riding second jockey to Noel, and it was... I was doing okay. I was tipping away, though. You know, I wasn't having brilliant volume of winners, but I was I was tipping away and working hard. And I would very much think that in in racing you can't let anything come to you. You have to go and get it. And mm. I was after having a bit of luck for Gavin and a couple of spare rides that were after winning last couple two years previous to that say. And uh, picked up the phone one day and I rang Gavin and said it would be okay if I came in and ride out. I could I was seeing that he was a yard that was going up and. He, he, he every day you look at the paper, he was having more and more runners, more and more entries, more and more winners. So I said, here, I want to try and see if I can get involved in that. So I pick up the phone one day, I rang Gavin, asked him, could I come in a day and ride out? And it all kind of went from there. My first ride from then, went whilst going in, riding out from, was a winner in Fairy House on a horse called Quanted Mental. And kind of all just spin rolled from there. And um, by that, the end of that summer then I was made stable jockey which was you know massive for my career and massive for me and great to be involved with such a great man and such a great trainer and great place you know it's it's it is staggering the you know the progress he's made because like when when I first came upon him I suppose it was the days of um Gerald's girl and so on and um I suppose like like maybe a lot of racing fans I didn't know an awful lot about him but he was frequently described as like the farrier who trains the odd horse um, in his in the in in his part time, and now he's become the trainer who sort of oversees a farrier operation. But that's like kind of never mentioned anymore. Like, how has it happened? Well, you can see yourself. You you you've been in Gavin's place. He's an incredibly hard working man, um, and obviously he's a very talented trainer as well. And he started getting more horses, and he was getting the results. So when you get the results, when you have the horses, you're going to keep on getting more and. I suppose a lot of owners and stuff throughout the country um, latched on to him. And yeah, he's anytime he gets the numbers of the horses, um, he delivers the goods. So yeah, he's very much the trainer now that has a farrier business, not the farrier that trains a few horses. I think he's a good example as well that like he would have obviously been friendly with Gordon Elliott and, you know, he, he would have kind of based some of his training regime on him. But I think like we can bemoan a situation in Ireland where all oh, like you know Willie Mullins wins everything and if he doesn't win everything Gordon Elliott picks up everything else but it's actually kind of the opposite it's a bit like the Kenny Ken Ken Hurlers and that they're driving standards up for everyone else and I think Gavin's a good example of that where he's basically gone full throttle into this um, and he you know he's developed his facilities to such an extent that this, there's no ceiling in terms of where he wants to go No exactly Gavin's very ambitious and as I say, very hard working and no stone is left unturned. He, you see, you see it yourself every day. Go to the yard, even every day. I'm in the yard four days a week, and there's there's work being done every day. More stables going up, um, stuff being done. The gallops, new gallop gone in this year. More school and facilities. He's just improving it the whole time, and I think that's the main thing to keep the wheel turning, keep improving, keep progressing. And he's big on that at the moment. And um, I suppose that's. The, the with 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 getting the, obviously the volume of horses and the results, he's able to keep the wheel turning and uh, he's turned it into a fantastic place. Jonathan, do you remember a horse called Georgie Shore in Galway? 
<laughs> I do. I was sitting down beside him at the second last Monday as well in Galway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Georgie Shore, like, I, I sometimes I do wonder about, like, work getting in the way of my life because um, I've never seen a horse that I own actually win. And when Georgie Shore won in Galway, where was I but in the office um, next to where you normally are, um, where News Talk have their, you know, meetings and kind of clash heads together and watching it with Dan McDonald as he got up in the line whilst um, everyone celebrating Galway. There was me having finished my uh, my Saturday shift on off the ball. Oh, well. Yeah. Look- it's lucky you should be in the office more often, Johnny. That's that's the only way to do that. Tell, tell us about the race and tell us about the uh, the superb ride that he was given by the jockey, Johnny. Well, to be fair, um, when when the horse was like he was bought cheaply and uh, he's very strong. Um, I have to give credit to uh, Liz Davison, who's uh, looking after him at the moment, and I. I, he's retired now, but when when um, when I saw him over the summer, he's he's very strong and. Um, He's he's definitely not uh, a kid's right, so to speak. And I think when Gavin got him, he was that strength was there. He was it, it's strange, like because I, I don't know what's the way he was trained or experiences he's had earlier in his life. He was a course that kind of went from the front, and for whatever reason, Gavin decided that the best way to um, kind of cajole this horse to produce his best was actually to to get him to settle. And um, Jonathan, that day, do you remember Johnny? The for, I don't know, was it the low sun, which has been in the news a lot lately? But like, there were, I think they only jumped like six hurdles in the race because of the sun conditions. So it kind of turned into like one of them all weather bumpers that they're running today, um, which wouldn't have suited them at all. And um, despite all of that, through through fifty percent, I suppose, to the will of the horse, but fifty percent to the utter genius of Jonathan Moore, it all came together. Yeah, no, it was a. Uh... It all worked out that day. He he yeah, we dropped him in last and he um he settled away and we creeped up away and he winged the last two and got up on the line, but uh, I knew I was always getting up, Johnny. Yeah, well so did I obviously as Dan McDonald will attest <laughs> as we were roaring at each other. But to be fair, Ger, like this like we're here obviously to talk about it, like a proper good horse in in, in the horses that they have and their recent grade one winner, but like even winning a naught to ninety five or not to one hundred and two, you can still produce a ride that like gives you an extreme buzz if you if you back the horse or if you're the owner of the horse. And I think that's the beauty of racing. Johnny was absolutely brilliant that day and it meant an awful lot to the likes of me. Well, I'm sure, and I think that's the whole point. Look, we, we will talk obviously a bit Leverstown in a moment but I you know listening to you talk about Gavin Cromwell and his ambition it seems like he kind of caught each other at a good time because you know listening to you talk about the four winless years and the time away like it all it all continues to sound like you are on a your own journey of continuous improvement and you know you're not going to settle for anything so like What's your ambition as a jockey? What, what, who, who do you want to replicate? Who do you want to beat? What, what are your targets? Well, like uh, I'm 26 now, and I suppose I've a lot of water under bridge already, and um, I just feel like I'm you know, ready to, to ride. I just want to ride as many winners as I can for Gavin and for everyone, and just I think Gavin's um, at that stage in his training career where he's ambitious and wants to really spur on and I'm at that stage in my jockey career where I'm ambitious and want to spur on and I suppose um really don't really set any targets but I just want to be better every be- just be better every year and get better results every year got the grade one winner at Leopardstown this year and just keep going and getting riding as many winners as I can and and good winners as well well, tell us about that then. That's Flooring Porter in the Leopardstown Christmas Hurdle on the 28th of December. What, what For people who didn't see the race, what was the race like? And at what point were you kind of, what point did you get victory and you kind of realised this was going to happen for Just you? Just to provide a bit of context before he comes on there, Ger, um, this was completely the opposite to George Shore in that it was a top class race, but also the fact that this was like literally tactically exactly the opposite. And what I, I uh, to add to your question, how much was it down to the jockey? Because you weren't riding a hot favourite. Um, well, he, he, as you see, he progressed through the ranks. Um, he he won impressively at Navin. We made a run on him at Navin, and it worked that day. So um, we decided uh, Leopardstown. Well, he first of all he was supplemented, which was a brave decision from the Floor and Porter Syndicate and Gavin and Phelan making the decision at home. Um, so he supplemented for the race first, and then. When when the declarations run and all, we could see there wasn't a whole pile of pace in the race, and we said, "Listen, we'll do the same thing as Nav and make the running." And um, 
see how it goes and the floor and Porter um I suppose he ran them all into the ground and uh, made me look okay. Well, if you're looking in terms of like, you know, I don't like focusing on Cheltenham or whatever, but um, he's obviously entitled to his place taken on the likes of Paisley Park. But how flattered was he by that performance? Or is that the sign of a proper three mile uh, staying herder who, for me, actually was kind of going away again at the line? Because I, I don't know the sectionals or whatever. Like, do you think, um, I know you got a bit of a solo, but like, he's obviously good as well. Yeah, there's a lot of people saying I got freebie or whatever, solo, as you say, but. Um, Mark Walsh and Sean Flanning are in behind me now and they said they couldn't go with me early. They said I like well I, I knew I went to good honest gallop anyway. But um they they said I didn't get a freebie that they just couldn't lie up with me early and uh, I suppose um Florin Porter was always in his comfort zone and stealing lengths everywhere and got good breeders before I turned in and was still going away it was quickened up well and went away to him at the line. He done it like a really good horse. Um I don't know how he'll compare now to the, the two good English horses, but uh, he couldn't have done it any better in Leperstown. And I think a little bit is taken away from saying that he got a freebie, but uh, mm. I think he actually made the, the race a test himself and nothing could go with him more than him um, getting a free lead. If there's Now, Gerrard is the ultimate professional, but if there's anything that will distract him, it's the thought of a long-term winner. So would this horse be one from to back in the world hurdle? Um, potentially, I hope so. Um, it doesn't look like you know the way they race in England that you're going to go and get five lengths on a on a race anywhere. But he was racing against Grade One horses in Leperstown and was able to do that. So, listen, he's, I think he's. I don't know if he's going to run between now and and Cheltenham. So he'll probably go to Cheltenham as a fresh horse, maybe. And mm. yeah, I, I I didn't I. I thought he'd run well at Christmas. wasn't expecting a performance like that. He's only he's only just gone six, so if he's still progressing, then um, he mightn't be a horse, um, the worst horse to back come Cheltenham at a, at a at a price probably that he is now. Well, just looking at the um, so there's a lot of talk in the build-up about Fury Road and uh, Fury Road finished fourth in that race. Sardar Belay finished third, and the storyteller was in second. So it was a high quality, very small field, but a high quality field. Yeah, no, it was a high quality race. Um, we knew like Sir Cider Bulle after winning in Cheltenham and Fury Road only getting beaten by Monkfish or whatever in, in the Albert Bartlett. The strong lines were or the, the form lines were strong in it and um he went he went a top quality field and yes, he's going over to Cheltenham as a as a live contender now. Um he surprised us. Um so hopefully he can see keep surprising us. Um, I was just looking at previous winners of the race there. I clicked the button and Apple's Jade won the race the last three years in a row. So not bad company. No, I, um, it's obviously a, a, a nice race to win. Um, I, I, I started off by talking about the excitement of this time of the year. Like, uh, How hard is it for you not to get carried away by the Dublin Racing Festival and then to already start thinking about Cheltenham? How do you keep focus on this weekend and the next race and making sure that your form is good and you're fit and you're doing all the right, getting enough sleep and you're eating properly and all that kind of stuff. Well, you see, you know, as you know, like racing is going every week and there's there's horses that are going to be running this weekend, horses that are going to be running next weekend and uh, horses that are running. So um, you have to keep focused at all times as you're all, you think about your next ride, your next, next ride that are coming and you probably don't really start thinking hard about those festivals till till they're staring you in the face as well. You know, it's 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 a game where you have to stay focused on all the horses and all all your rides, and um, just keep a, a distant eye on the on those festivals. What else has Gavin Cromwell got in the yard at the moment that you're excited about? Um, he has he's a few really nice horses. Um. Well, obviously, Darver Star, he was second in the grade one there at Stevens' day. And he's, um, I think he might go up and trip actually for the Dublin Race Festival. So he's obviously looking for, looking forward to him. And then we have a, a nice young novice, Vanilla, second in the grade two down in Limerick in ground that he wouldn't have been favourable to him. I think he's going to be a, a real Albert Bartlett contender. Um, 
And then obviously I have Gabby Nacco in the grade one there and Nace on Sunday. He's a, he's a lovely young horse. And there's a few, there's a vintage Prosecco at home there. And uh, there's, there's a few really nice horses there. Um, present New York, a young filly. There's, there's loads of real nice young horses in, in Gavin's yard. And that lets be clear about another bump horse, but there's really, there's really good um, team coming together for the spring festival. So, um, I'm just looking forward um, to all them, but uh, as I say, um, we'll focus on the race days that are coming at us at present. Yeah, yeah you, you spoke about being 26 and, uh, you know, you're making me feel very old, but like we had Sam Ewing on there not that long ago and he's riding Murrahin. Um, now, there's a bit of a story behind Murrahin, Ger, um because Gavin Cromwell bought him off Jamie Osborne and they basically had a toss for whether he'd cost three grand or one grand and they recorded it, I think, live or they certainly recorded a video for WhatsApp. Uh, Gavin won the toss, so the horse cost one grand and he was bought by Ray Donahue and his dad, John. Um, and I, I think Gavin gave, it to, gave them the option of taking the horse because uh, they felt Gavin felt that this could provide them with um, the first winner. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, he is running in Dundalk at five o'clock. And all I want to know from you, Johnny Moore, is I don't really want to end about your well-being, your family, your kids, your future. Will Murrahan win the five o'clock? <laughs> I'd say he's going there with a life chance anyway. He seems well at home. And uh, Sam Ewan obviously taking a valuable seven pounds off or whatever. So... I, I I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be saying he's going there or not without a big chance. Top man. That's all you wanted. I'm glad you <laughs> use this platform for such good uh, such good ends there, Johnny. Yeah, well, it's it's a horse that I was um, wasn't a million miles off procuring myself, so his chance of actually doing that and expro- improved exponentially when that didn't happen. But I I am really hopeful for the lads that. Um, he provides him with the winner. He's drawn one. Now, I don't know why he's been very, very slowly out of the gates at times, but he's not a, a bad horse by any means, and I think he'll take an awful lot of beating if he can break it all. And Sam Ewing is almost as um, promising a jockey as I've seen in a long time, to be honest. Yeah, no. Um, Look, Jonathan, you've been great with you. Go on, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was just saying that the stars thing, he's, he's, he's actually very quick out of stars at home and all, and anytime he's slow... It's probably him being a bit of a monkey, but um, I wouldn't be worried about the stalls with him anyway. Listen, Jonathan, it's a brilliant story. Congratulations on the success to this point, and I've no doubt that um, it's going to continue for you in this vein. You know, it sounds like you're in a sweet spot now where you've got the uh, the work ethic and the experience, but also the quality of horses. So, um, you know, congratulations, and it's great to have you with us. Thanks a million. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks very much, sir. Thanks, Johnny. Something more there, our guest this week. A reminder, of course, Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Um, any other particular highlights for you over Christmas? This is our first live show since um, everything it happened is, at, yeah. uh, at Leopardstown and Kempton. Um, none of our big price tips from our pre-Christmas special came up, but uh, we did tell everybody about Charger, who uh, charged home for victory for Patrick Mullins. So hopefully some people were on that. Well, it was a very entertaining show. Whatever about the the tips, um, you know, maybe didn't go that well. It was, uh, I don't know, Ger. It was it was a mad Christmas. Like I was, I have to say, it was, you know, I was. You want to be at these meetings at Christmas. You want to be at Leopard Sound if you're, if you're living around London. You want to be at Kempton. But like, it's just at the moment. Um, to be honest, like we're privileged to be able to watch this stuff in the box with with the situation globally. We're just very fortunate that there is racing on that um we can watch this top class race. And um I I don't know the horse that for me, um I wrote a story on racing TV about him this week. Um Joe Donnelly and his wife, they they're famous art dealers. Joe is a really storied life. Um he was quite sick uh, a few years ago, but he's bounced back. Um he obviously owns album photos potentially on the cusp of winning a third gold cup and um, having won again on his prep run at Tremor on New Year's Day and Joe has Shishkin he's all these good horses and um, the, the big getaway who was one of my 10 to follow um, who won at Christmas but he, he's acquired this French Asile who um, came from France and he ran in a juvenile maiden hurdle um, and he produced an absolutely extraordinary performance I, I for Elmery Holden now he's transferred to William Mullins um, I can't get over how this horse is still 7-1 to to win the Triumph Hurdle I know Zana here who was good himself in his uh, graded uh, performance at Everton he's very good he's very hard to pick a hole in this horse won a maiden hurdle by like 20 odd lengths with another I don't know like 
10 or 15 back to the horse in third, despite running a bit keenly, despite no hurling experience, for me, he looks monstrously exciting. Unless I'm completely missing something, and sometimes when something looks too good to be true, it is. I, 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 can, I think this horse like could, could absolutely bolt off at Cheltenham. And he's joined Willie Mullen, so he was the one that, for me, I've... I've I had two Cheltenham bets anti post wide receiver for the Albert Bartlett. I don't know if he's going to run there, but he's alive if he does. For presented Percy, who ran a shocker at Leopardstown, so I don't know what's happening with him. But the third one I had and the biggest one I've had is French Steel to win the Triumph Hurdle. Um, I think he's a machine. French Steel, as in a, a seal. No, French Aseel, A S E E L. So I, I don't know what that um, necessarily means, but um, he's he was bought for presumably quite good money by um, Joe Donnelly and uh, you know w- Willie obviously doesn't won't have him that long but uh, he's he knows what it takes to win the Triumph Hurdle it was on about um, you know Willie and Gordon dominating but I, I genuinely would be shocked if Zana here or French Seal don't win the Triumph Hurdle nothing looks close to them in my view Tell me what what is your sense now about whether or not the Irish horses will be at Cheltenham this year I like I, I don't know um, to be honest sir like I've you know that my any anything that I've said on the coronavirus has proven to be, you know, so hard to predict. I I've no idea. I thought we'd be out in the clear at this stage. So me trying to predict in March, I know that um they'll do all in their power for Irish horse to go over there. But you know, if we have a situation now where they're talking about hospitals running in in London basically soon being overrun, hundred people in ICU in Ireland, for me to be predicting what's going to happen with regard to horse in March, and um, considering how utterly useless I've been, um, and even from a racing context, I I was a bit afraid to be honest that racing could be vulnerable because the situation has become so bad. So at this stage, I've no idea. But if you were to put a gun to my head. I would say, yeah, Cheltenham will go ahead with Irish runners there, but in terms of a crowd, I've no idea. All right, okay, let's move on because there has been a change at the top of the tote 10 to follow leaderboard. Nice of you to bring it up, Johnny, but uh, tough luck because I'm now ahead. What? Um, I've got the number one spot back with a little help from two grade one winners, Aplutard and Sharjah at Leopardstown over Christmas. Oh, Looks you like Sharjah? We now have a genuine title race, yeah? Well, uh, two I'll... points. Go on. Two points, so it's 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 um yeah that looks pretty tough. Well, I was looking up my ten follow list there. Lexer Dane um hasn't run, but all the other nine have all won. So we are we're actually going. The two of us have have done quite well. I would see. I I'm amazed you took the lead. So um there you go. Yeah, we've got the Dublin Racing Festival at Leopardstown next month to look forward to. Remember, any of our ten to follow winnings will go to the Irish Injured Jockeys Fund. See tote.ie for all the information. And um, that's pretty much all we've got time for for this week's show. Um, people looking forward, essentially, at this point, the best horses are kind of probably in mothballs for the Dublin Racing Festival, are they? Well, to an extent, so Nace on Sunday has a, it's its main race day of the whole year. Um, if you want to if you want to be of the opinion that the flat is bigger than the jumps, which as a good Irish man or woman, you probably should say it is. But they have the Lawlers of Nace Novice Hurdle at 2.30. Um, and this is a really, really good, you know, it's it's become a very pivotal race kind of in, in their season. But um, the proviso, obviously, Ger, at the moment is if, if you've been out today or if you're out early in the morning, um, it is very, very cold. And Nace might be called off. But if it is called off, I think it's going to be rescheduled for next week. In any event, uh, that's a fantastic race. And the, the aforementioned wide receiver who's been put in at 14 to 1, I think, um, which with Paddy Power, big prize to me under Jack Kennedy, uh, will take his chance against the likes of Blue Lord, who's seriously well regarded, and Bob O'Linger, who's a gorgeous horse, but has a big challenge on here. It's a brilliant, brilliant renewal. Okay, so if that goes ahead, keep an eye out for it. And if it doesn't, we'll talk about it um, on next week's show, hopefully. Friday Night Racing and Off the Ball, brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. We'll see you next week. Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.